us. All right. I think we are connected. Cool. I see us live on Restream, Dave. I'm going cool. to check. Uh, yeah, Alicia, usually when we go live, we want to, again, double check that everything is working as expected. You know, it's a <laughs> plug and play system, but uh, we've been into many issues thus far, so we always want to <laughs> make sure everything's good. Absolutely. I see us live on LinkedIn, Vlad. So good. I think we should. I think we should be good to go. So um, as, as we get started, as uh, as all regular listeners know, we kind of give everyone a couple of minutes to get in, and we do some uh, some community shout outs. Uh, and my, my favorite as part as of the beginning started, of this as, is uh, slightly uh, embarrassing Vlad, because uh, Ali, as you may know, Vlad has a very successful YouTube channel called Solus PLC, where he teaches people all sorts of PLC programming, and they are they're, they're what twenty three thousand now, Vlad. Uh, have you Something guys, like that. They're nice. at like 23,000 subscribers. And so my goal from the beginning of this is to get a nice silver play button like over Vlad's right shoulder. So we've got a ways to go <laughs> to hit that 100,000 subscriber mark. And Vlad will not Thanks, ask Dave. for people. So uh, so th this is my Solus PLC shout out. So uh, if you guys are not already subscribed, please go subscribe to Solus PLC. Uh, we've got a couple of other um, exciting announcements coming up in the next uh, in the next week and through the next month. So, uh, so Copia Automation, uh, who you guys will hear more about next week, is doing a webinar on the seventh. So that's next Tuesday, uh, right before the next episode, talking about modern version control, uh, meeting industrial automation, and Git based PLC programming. And so that should be a very good show. I've seen a handful of the webinars before, and know Adam, and that should be a very good webinar. So I've uh, gone ahead and dropped links in there. Uh, additionally, uh, friends of the show, Frank Lamb and Jordan Humphreys are on Frank's show, Mastering the Machine, this coming Friday morning at 10 o'clock Central Time, 11 o'clock East Coast Time, uh, talking about talent and recruiting and whatever they get into. I think that'll absolutely be a very good show if you guys have the chance to, uh, to catch that. And that I've also dropped links um, in the comments to, uh, to Frank's post. That is, you guys will join uh, the Zoom. And then other than that, uh, Preston Hadley, he's been on a couple of times. You guys probably know him for his Change of Life giveaway. He has the third giveaway coming up now. It's a Siemens S7-1500, an S210 Servo Kit, TIA Portal V16, um, and Vlad on Solus PLC is actually putting out weekly videos talking about the S7-1500 and everything inclusive in that kit. And so you guys have the chance to actually win that whole kit. Um, I've gone and dropped the link on LinkedIn, at least, uh, for all of that information below. Uh, the one comment I'll make about that, there's more than 300 entries. Uh, Preston's always ask is that his goal for this has been for someone who otherwise would not have had the opportunity to get their hands on this hardware. And so if you guys are mid to end of career and have enough toys, please go ahead and uh, send this to someone else who might more benefit uh, from that early in their career. Um, and then beyond that, you know, Vlad and I are on here all the time, every Wednesday. If you haven't got enough of us, or if you prefer to listen to podcasts, you guys can check us all out at manufacturinghub.live. Now I'm going to take a breath and ask Vlad if he has any other thoughts before we, uh, before we jump in. I do not, Dave. I think that was a very thorough announcement segment, uh, really cool events, but uh, do you want to kick us off with uh, today's episode? Absolutely. No, uh, everyone, welcome to Manufacturing Hub with me, Dave, and this guy down here, Vlad. We've somehow managed to make it to episode 27, and we're going to talk about horror stories uh, with Ali G. So without much further ado, welcome to the show, Ali. Thank you for having us. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. I think it's really good to get uh, a perspective from someone who's been doing systems integration for quite a bit of time. And, uh, you know, to kick us off, maybe uh, give us your background. What have you done? What have you enjoyed? How did you get into manufacturing? How did you get into controls specifically? Sure. Um, so I started as a, I have a, a chemical engineering degree. Um, so I started as a process engineer and I really liked that. Um, and I, you know, 
did it for at least four years before I, you know, saw an opportunity to uh, jump over into the control sector. And uh, I found that I totally love it. And um, yeah, um, so I guess in terms of <laughs> background, um, Well, how was maybe the what what was the transition? What pushed you to move from traditional process maybe design into controls? What was the the spark? I was well, okay, so I was looking for a job and I was, you know, not I was in Phoenix. I wasn't able to find, you know, the job that I wanted um because I would have had to do process engineering in like semiconductors. And that wasn't something that I was interested in. I was working with um algae, which, you know, is its own thing in itself and um yeah to try to you know work in process engineering where i was and not wanting to actually move um i started looking for anything um i looked at like environmental firms and you know what can i do as a process engineer and i found maverick and so i actually became a systems integrator just by you know making a lateral move and jumping from process engineering to uh systems integration and so that's kind of where I started and where, you know, I got yeah started in controls was with Maverick. And how was the learning process that they have you, I guess, like during the interview, you probably explained to them that your background is more on the process side and that you definitely are interested in controls, but they probably understood that there would be some kind of a learning curve. So I'm curious, how did they approach that? Did they send you to a formal training that you have to learn on your own? And again, how was that done? Did you go in person? So some classes? they had, they had pretty good. So when they hired me, they actually hired a lot, uh, like 15 people. I think at the time they were doing a big, um, a big hire and they did have a pretty good setup system of, you know, assigning, you know, every new engineer, cause they hired a bunch of, you know, lots of kids straight out of college. And then a few of us that had a couple years in, you know, either manufacturing or, you know, like I had been a process engineer and some other people had been, you know, other types of other process engineers in other types of industries kind of came on at the same time. And, but we were taught from scratch because they were, you know, taking kids straight out of college. So they would start with, you know, what is, how do you set the IP address on your laptop? you know, from literally from scratch. So you didn't have to know anything about controls. Um, and I had already worked in um, a greenfield build as a process engineer. Mm -hmm. So I actually had to do like startup and had to do loop checks and had to do IO checkout before. And so I had worked with um, the, uh, you know, controls engineers and controls and electrical contractors to actually build out, uh, you know, control man or automation systems and you know, from having that experience, uh, I had like quite a bit of a jump start um, when I moved over to um, controls engineering, just because I understood the equipment um, that was being controlled. When I, you know, I would approach a project, um, it was simpler. Yeah, for that reason, no, that makes sense. Can you? Elaborate just a little bit on uh, the term greenfield, because I think a lot of people will understand once you explain it. But what does it mean to go sure. on like a greenfield project? Okay, a greenfield means that there's nothing there. So maybe you already had the land, but you probably didn't even have the land. And you start with, I want to build a, you know, a ma manufacturing of something um, and or some type of operations, you know, and on a piece of land and you start with nothing. So you designed um, on paper everything and then actually have to build it in real life and find out. And that's why it's, you know, they call it greenfield is because there was you know, supposedly just a green field there and it got turned into like a factory. Mm -hmm. And to turn it into, you know, an entire factory is quite a process and, and quite an, a, a really mm -hmm. good experience if you can get into it. You know, when they're building something from the ground up, that's... Um, really exciting stuff to get into yeah and i think like having that opportunity early on problem happens when you sorry sorry you cut out a little bit go ahead no i don't know what happened it cut out sorry. I, I was gonna i was gonna say i think it's really interesting to have such an opportunity early on in your career right because i think you get to oh, yeah. see 
a project that goes from zero to 100 in obviously in a span of months or maybe years, but you also work with very diverse engineers, right? And obviously, I don't know how much details you can share from like a proprietary standpoint, but there's probably process engineers, electrical, mechanical, industrial, and all sorts of stakeholders involved in something like that, where you need to make very important calls on how to design the system. Um, absolutely. Um, and you get to learn, um, you know, because there's an entire time and energy at the beginning of, of those projects done to get, you know, the, the design on paper. Uh, but that paper is very, very far from what is actually going to be built. And so, you know, there, those engineers sometimes are involved all the way through and sometimes they're not. And um, you kind of just get to see, yes, the, it's not even just engineers. I mean, the engineers do all of this paperwork, but you know, there's a lot of people involved in actually building it, even down to purchasing, you know, and, and you know, the operations of just even, uh, you know, we had a, tra a little trailer out where we were and um, I can just share as much as I can share. And, you know, it was two main engineers, me and a mechanical engineer. And uh, I kind of took over the, um, the, the electrical contractors, so everyone, you know, putting in conduit, but power and controls, and then, you know, the the controls vendor, um, you know, was a group, and so, you know, they were going to do any programming or, you know, provide the panels, um, but, you know, you had to coordinate between them, and I was a process engineer, so I knew what equipment we were buying, because I, you know, helped pick it and kept kept inventory of it and kept detailed equipment lists. But I had to, you know, communicate with the people that were actually going to put the equipment in. So mechanical groups and piping groups. Um, and then, you know, we even got into later, you know, uh, civil and drainage and, you know, building a greenfield plant is everything. It's not, you know, and so I had my little, my little part of it, but I got to see you know, what happens after it gets built and then support it and then try to optimize it um, so that. Yeah, hopefully, I mean, some of those building operational things fall on the mechanical engineers, but, you know, it, it's <laughs> yes. sometimes more difficult to avoid than we'd like for sure. But seeing it, I think, is is very interesting because, again, I think all these uh, new plants are going through the same kind of a, of a process or, I guess, steps to get it done. So that definitely makes sense. But no, I mean, maybe you want to dive into some of the pitfalls of that process, so to speak, or maybe your experience on how the traditional, let's say, systems integrators get it done versus what could be done better. Um, okay, <laughs> sure. Um, so I guess communication, that's, you know, the, pro the problem in every project. It doesn't even matter what kind of project it is. And when there's multiple players, and in this case, multiple companies, because you have to have somebody that is, you know, the project manager, um, but also of the, you know, the, the superintendent, I guess, and and manage, you know, you know, safety between all these contractors, and then actually making sure that they all understand via email or meetings or however they're going to communicate um, what what the expectations are, um, and then you know the other part of it is when start stuff starts to happen bad and you can start seeing you know that schedules are not being met people are not rushing to um you know communicate those things so you kind of have to like be on top of it watching as people are almost hiding you know those what's going on in terms of schedule and so um it's it's definitely really difficult but you know how do you avoid that is you you have a very solid understanding between all of the contractors who, who is in charge of the site. Um, I think that that's another big one where, you know, who is actually in charge does, does matter. Um, and, you know, how, how the information is gonna get from the customer out to all these different groups, um, you know, how to prevent making that into like a game of telephone and having it, you know, change and by the time that, you know, the people are actually building it, they have no idea what was original. I think I saw a really cool diagram. I need to find it. That's just like everybody's different perspective in manufacturing of what they were supposed to build 
or what they, you know, like even sales has their version of it, you know, and <laughs> of what the plant will look like. And mm-hmm. so you know, every group that was involved in putting these plants together um, has to have an aligned view. And that's the biggest problem that doesn't, you know, that's what doesn't happen is that they don't know. Um, yeah. And I don't know about you, Dave. I don't think I've ever seen a perfect communication (laughs) example of a project right like i think there's always different flaws just because of the i guess the human nature but also uh it takes a lot of effort i think to communicate well and so there's not always a dedicated person that can orchestrate that right like we tend to i almost want to say like cut cost on that person and not have (laughs) a dedicated project manager and um, I guess that's why you would see something like that on the field. And I personally have witnessed a lot of projects uh, have the exact same issue that you've described. Dave, what, what are your thoughts on this? Absolutely. I think your, your comment on, you know, everyone being human is, uh, is the one that most rings true. And it seems like no matter how much communication and over communication you're going to have going into a project, you know, the engineer that drew it up and the process folks on the plant floor and procurement and everyone else has their, you know, idea of perfect. And as you get further and further into the details, it becomes our perfect, you know, maybe diverge just enough so that we have unintended consequences and unintended problems uh, as we get further into it. And I think that, that that's very much human nature. And to Ali's point, you know, unless you have one person who owns the whole project um, and they are the decision maker, uh, then it becomes, you know, it just, it diverges. And the larger the projects, the harder and harder it is to keep everyone focused on the uh, the same task at hand. And what about, uh, so two main groups, right, that we see a lot of discussions nowadays about. So OT versus IT. So operations versus I think there's, I think, always not necessarily a disconnect, but I think different views on how to get certain things done. Mm-hmm. So going into traditional systems integration um, and once the project is deployed, what are maybe some of the challenges that you see there? Um, so the challenges are the overlapping, um, the overlapping, I guess, vocabulary. You know, when something has an IP address, you know, that's when I think now we're, we don't know whose it is anymore. And when I say whose it is, I'm talking about like the SCADA groups and the people that are, you know, maintaining the software mm-hmm. and, and, you know, upgrading it or, you know, doing troubleshooting or whatever of the, the SCADA software versus just the, you know, the, the servers themselves, the company's entire servers, you know, that IT is taking care of all of the computers inside of a company and, and all of the data, um, including the you know, data of the company, the personal you know, company data and financial data. And there's just data and data and data and the OT people do not know anything about or care at all about any of that data. Um, they care about you know, their operational systems. And so you know, OT is all of that stuff that is moving that is um, out there actually, you know, producing something typically, um, or some some form of operations. And so there's equipment out there, um, you know, and there's people out there, operations people and operations, you know, and there there's entire data systems over there. And so they are data systems. They're both data systems. And so when I, they start co- colliding, is when there's responsibilities over the safety of those, not safety, but the you know, responsibility of upkeeping the the safety and operational, um, you know, functionality of SCADA systems, because there it's still a software, but it runs on a computer. So yeah. eventually, IT will will be around, and that's where that um, the clashes start happening. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I think that's the challenge. You know, I've been uh, thinking about this for quite some time. And I think me and Dave even spoke about what's the future look like, right? Is it one room where IT and controls engineers sit together? Is it controls engineers that learn IT or, I guess, networking, so to say? Is it IT people that learn controls, which I think is going to be a much more difficult transition? 
but uh, yes. it's definitely going to have to change, right? Because we can go into like one practical example that we've discussed um, off camera, which is managing updates, right? And that's like an entire, I think, uh, debate nowadays in manufacturing plants, because once you have a data collection system that pulls data, let's say, from manufacturing, but it can also, let's say, control some of those equipments, then you start having to install that on, let's say, a Windows platform. Obviously, you can do it on Linux, but that's a separate discussion. And if you start updating those systems when it's not desirable to, let's say, bring that equipment down, then it makes it very challenging to figure out who's responsible for this, who's going to handle the, again, communication to operations. And it gets into this whole, I, I would say, like messy debate on who owns that piece of hardware, which has control software, but it has IT, quote unquote, infrastructure. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, what are your thoughts, I guess, on that perspective? Because uh, I know you've done a little bit of research on how different companies even recommend that. But do you want to elaborate a little bit more on what needs to happen so that I think our viewers understand the issue a little bit better and then we can talk about the, the solutions? Well, Vlad, sure. before we do that, I think I like a couple of good stories of, okay. you know, best practices gone completely wrong and Windows sure. updates taking down SCADA servers. And, and okay. I think that, uh, Ellie, would, would you be willing to kind of share a couple of those horror stories as to it's, what it's you've also, seen? <laughs> it's not so much as horror, because if you say okay. horror, then I have to have like something horrible happen at the end. But, you know, to me, because I have anxiety, I, you know, anything that causes anxiety is pretty horrible. And so, yeah. you know, I can get or give myself and I know other people will get, you know, anxiety from uh, taking operations down. Um, that should give oh, people yeah. some yep. some crazy anxiety, I think. <laughs> but um, yeah, with with that in mind, I think that um, uh, there's just so many instances, unless you know, unless you have a, a detailed and you you know you know who's doing the the Windows updates on your SCADA servers, unless you have this all planned out, and it's part of your you know I don't maintenance, and you do this mm -hmm. every you know it's planned out like, you know, a normal operation that you expect. There's just everything that you could possibly think could go wrong, like will go wrong if you just patch it. Like mm -hmm. it, it's, there's the, the, and none of it was like tested. So there's just, um, you know, the, it, there's two parts of SCADA, right? There's the, the, the visualizing and the display of, of information SCADA part, the, the supervisory control part. And then there's the you know data acquisition part, and literally patches will break different parts of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've so I've seen where you know they just do whatever patches available. Um, you know, and every time you open a virtual machine that's running whatever SCADA software is on there, um, you know it's gonna it's gonna remind you that there are Windows updates. Like so, it's mm -hmm. you know it's constantly going to tell you do the thing and you need to not do the thing. And the reason <laughs> is because, you know, it, it's your job and you're trying to do the right thing and it's just not going to go well for you. And your anxiety is going to um, make you pay. And so you really there, and, and a, at least there is a right way, but you know, that's the, that is the horror part of this is um, you, you're not trying to harm anything and you actually do a lot of harm um, and, um, get yourself into a lot of trouble and, and get a lot of people angry, <laughs> really yeah. angry. Um, and so if you want to avoid all that, um, there's, there's a right way to do it. And this, um, issue with SCADA platforms and Microsoft patches goes back forever. Um, for as long as SCADA, I think has been around there, it's had to figure out how to deal with the patches. And so, um, so because this is old, all of the SCADA manufacturers have figured out that, you know, when the people are not going to soft patch it, all actually come together, not come together, they have all individually developed solutions for for this. And so they actually, each one I found, you know, Rockwell has this, Siemens has this, Delta V 
um, Honeywell, everybody that has, you know, any kind of SCADA platform that they provide and that you put on a Windows <laughs> server um, uh, has a team of people that is in some way, you know, taking all the patches every month and trying to break all their stuff, trying to break their own SCADA systems and then reporting back. I did all of these and we watched it and we didn't see any, like nothing broke that we saw. And they just report that and they just, and so there's, you know, resources and there's money going into making sure that this stuff is being tested and reported and you're not paying, you know, you're not paying for that service. Mm -hmm. So they're literally for free, just, you know, testing what's going to happen and letting you know so that you can do the right, you can use the right patches or avoid. That's what you want. You want to avoid the ones that are going to do the thing where the angry phone calls start happening yes. and you don't know where those are and you can kind of guess, but don't do that. Like you should just, but don't, whatever you do, don't, don't just do the mm -hmm. updates. Don't do it. <laughs> don't please. <Absolutely. laughs> um, and, and better yet, you know, get together with the SCADA people and, or bring all the mm -hmm. SCADA people and the IT people responsible for those assets and schedule when these, patches are going to get done and um you know just agree to disagree that you know I, one a group with skate up wishes that you could just never do the patches and actually back in the day before they developed all of these you know patch qualification teams they were actually telling you in the manual disable disable windows updates like anytime you would you know put in on a skata they're just like we recommend that you just don't even ever update this and that's just because it, there's going to be issues, but mm -hmm. instead they've, you know, taken to, we have to actively test these and now they do that. And they're, you know, it's all available. All the information is there on which ones that came out and what's going to be okay. And so if you just use that as the guide and, you know, do scheduling and communication, if you do communication, <laughs> so many, um, so many horror stories of the future will go away, but those are all happening right now. These horror stories, yep. and this is this is avoidable. Like, yeah, taking really angry phone calls are super avoidable. That's that's all I'm saying. Absolutely, and and I would just I would add to that not just even you're going to break the systems in you know some segments that you're going to spend hours either going oh, yeah. back you're to the spend previous hours. Iteration previous iteration or trying to fix them but you're also going to take servers down that may be critical and if it's during production you know, if you're running production and you start taking servers down only bad things are going to happen and the facilities go down because you ran a windows patch update now i've certainly seen that more than once and uh yeah uh, yeah that, that that is always a bad time yeah i think uh Alicia, you cover that. Uh, you cover that really well. I think um, ultimately, you know, it's important to recognize that there's no truly bad intentions. You know, when those patches yes. happen, it's just. Yes. I think uh, not enough understanding of what's running on those servers, right? So IT mm -hmm. folks always control the infrastructure, so they're looking to patch the OS, which Windows is notorious for pushing updates. <laughs> you know, it's almost like. Well, it's going to push automatically unless you cancel it in four hours, right? On like, let's say a home <laughs> machine on the service. It's, I think it's going to get there, right? Like it's going to constantly ping you where it's trying to update unless you specifically tell it not to. So I think they have the right intentions with obviously patching the security features and whatever else is uh, on the Windows side, but they don't always recognize that again, the vendors of, let's say, SCADA systems are a little bit slower to catch up on those patches than, let's say, I don't know, a normal um, Internet Explorer browser that you have on your machine or Word or whatever that's going to be patched immediately and usually is not affected by uh, something of that nature, right? So it, it's different when they patch laptops across the company versus when they patch a server that's running uh, system critical infrastructure. But no, I, I really like that story. Like I said, I've experienced this myself. And I think many people, if they haven't seen it yet, they will, because I think there's more and more network devices going on to the plants going forward. Dave, what are your thoughts? I, I, I absolutely, I absolutely agree with one of all of these. And I know Frank and some other people in the chat have also mentioned that they have been in this unfortunate but completely you, you know 
uh, fixable situation. And so kind of to, to Vlad's earlier point, uh, Ali, you've been going through and doing a bunch of kind of research and, and we've been talking back and forth. Uh, can you kind of share uh, what, what you're seeing and kind of maybe talk a little bit about the conversations you have with folks, with all of the recommendations from Rockwell and Siemens and everyone else as to how to appropriately patch. And maybe if you've had good conversations on the IT side, uh, mostly please don't push live patches that are available because they're gonna break all my servers. Um, yeah, no, I, that's it's usually well-received information okay. to actually finally show, um, you know, even the, the Rockwell patch qualification website um, is, is a huge relief um, when people see it. And I, you know, the, the few IT people I have shown it to um, received it well. So, um, and, and they, you know, nobody wants to cause problems. Um, so as soon as they know that they are the one doing that, um, they definitely normally jump to stop. Um, and so I think uh, just, knowing where that information is. And actually, I mean, if you Google and I, I have, you know, put together some of that information, mm -hmm. so it's all in one place, but, you know, you need to know what SCADA software you have. That's, I think the, you know, the information that from the IT side, you need to know that way you can look up, you know, if it's Rockwell, then you can go do the Rockwell Microsoft patches. But, you know, if you do uh, Microsoft patches or, or Windows updates, and then the name of your SCADA software, you will find all of that information about. So I went and looked at, you know, Delta V, and then you know I looked for Windows updates, and you know I looked for Siemens, and I found that actually Siemens has, you know, a pretty sophisticated system that wants to actually automatically do it. Um, have their own, you know, version of their patch quality thing, but. Um, they go a little further and actually, you know, have systems where they can, um, you know, you subscribe to them and they will, you know, update your SCADA servers with whatever is safe for the SCADA servers um, in terms of Microsoft patching and, and scheduling that and recording that it was done and just kind of having like a trail of, you know, that, that being done is awesome. Um, and, and for having, you know, the SCADA side of it, wanting to do that is really cool. Um, but you know, all of them have these teams and all of that data is all online, um, at the individual, you know, vendors websites and, you know, and if, if you read about, you know, there's definitely, you know, Tofino and, um, lots of, you know, individual, you know, vendors that are selling, um, you know, all kinds of, you know, security and safety you know, services and, and products. And, you know, this is just one aspect of uh, an ever evolving, I guess, you know, safety and cybersecurity challenge. Um, yeah, so I mean, I would say, you know, at the end of the day, make sure that there's communication between all parties, make sure that everybody knows when the patches are going to go out, try and schedule them, obviously, during downtime. And uh, yeah, read the official documentation. As you said, I think they get engineers involved in actually trying this out. They run different versions. They see how the patch affects the system. And then they report back on their websites saying, you know, like maybe these are the, the deficiencies. This is what you should be doing. This is how you address the, those challenges. But it makes, uh, it makes a lot of sense to do it that way. What about uh, the safety side of things? I'm curious to hear if you have any stories. Um, again, definitely don't want to get anybody external in trouble, but uh, I'm curious what you've seen in manufacturing. You know, there's a lot of regulations around safety, but there's certainly not, uh, not all of them are being followed to the T, so to speak. Yeah, I think the biggest uh, violation that I've you know, either witnessed, seen, come across, heard stories of is, uh, you know, people touching live, live, live 480 and live three phase systems. I don't mean people in switch gears. I mean, people in industrial control panels or MCCs that they feel comfortable with because, you know, they, you know, you see a lot of the same devices, you know, and people, you know, there's VFDs behind you. I think three phase when, you know, I see those, but um, you know, there's lots of personnel, you know, including engineers, especially engineers, 
uh, that get you know super comfortable with those systems and don't necessarily know that you know that that's not something that they should be um, in front of when it's live. And yes, uh, there's you know there's the uh, there's the startup process. You can't you can't troubleshoot and start things. And so there's a whole aspect of you know service. Um, but there's teams of people that are you know out there doing that, and engineers are not supposed to do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so um, I guess that's the biggest thing I see. You know, is and I'm I'm myself very hands on, um, and so I want to you know wire everything myself, and I want to you know I you know I want I I know how to defeat the panel and open it and get in there. (laughs) Um, And so, and I think there's a lot of people who can defeat, you know, the panel mechanism that maybe need to step back and think about and watch more arc flash panels or sorry, more arc flash videos. That's, that's where I'm getting at is, um, you know, that there's, there's a comfort um, that's a dangerous, a dangerous comfort out there that I have seen and have been, you know, guilty of that, that comfort. What do you think is the remedy to this? I think it's a discussion worth having. You know, let's say you have a new engineer that's been brought to a manufacturing facility, which definitely has, you know, 480 panels, what have you. Uh, But even 110, let's say by NFPA standards, it is uh, not pleasant, let's say, to come in contact with. So, you know, how do you provide training, which I think should be the number one step, but then should you put maybe punitive measures where if you're seeing without PPE touching some of those high voltage um, equipment, then you just be like walk out, walked out the floor. Like, what are your thoughts on how do we prevent this? And again, maybe it is subjecting them to sitting in front of these videos where they see some very, I would say like troublesome accidents happen with high voltages. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you do have to train people. I don't know that, you know, that you need to instill fear um, there should be a fear there, right? There, you mm-hmm. should be afraid of dying. First of all, like when you're in front of these systems, like you can die, like, and, or you can watch someone die and you don't want either of those things in your life. Um, and so I think just having that conversation that, you know, I guess it's so for some people, it's everything is, you know, everyday stuff. And if once you see something every day, then you really just don't care about it anymore. And that complacency is super dangerous. And that that is part of the training is to, you know, keep reiterating that, you know, being coming complacent with these systems, because I love controls and I love VFDs. And I, I love turning on VFDs and like the sound they make. Okay. I love that stuff. Um, so I love, you know, electronics and I love not just controls, but power too is really, really cool stuff. And I don't, I don't want to just like, you know, shut the door. So like literally on people's faces and have them, you know, don't look in here. Don't, don't even, you know, be in here, but, but do it extremely safely and do and and understand that it is extremely dangerous, actually what's, you know, what's in there as cool as it all is. And it's, it's fine until it touches you and then you're in huge trouble. And, you know, I've, I myself have been in situations where, uh, you know, I was just like, I'm not going to turn this off. And it was just 120, so whatever. And you know, I for I forget, uh, instantly forget. It's it's just it's so easy. It's so easy. And I've seen people do it in their homes. You know, there's just like uh, they get frustrated, and it's like let me go get stuck. You know, and you ceiling fan. Okay, uh, <laughs> but uh, I I think the biggest thing is just emphasizing how real of a threat it is because it's right there you know if you want to you can definitely just that it could be the end right there like right there yeah so and i I think you mentioned it well too like i mean complacency right like as you maybe let's say you get comfortable with 110 you slowly see that oh maybe like i can rewire something stuff yeah. 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 Like for sure. And I mean, like there's, there's also, I, you know, like let's not sugarcoat it. There's pressure from let's say operations to get things running, right? Like there's, you're always to some extent under the clock. Someone's always like, can we shorten this deadline? Can we make sure the line's running faster? And so to some extent you're, how to say it, not predisposed, but I guess like you're, it's easier to cut corners, right? Like what someone pressures yes. you to get it done. And so I think it's, 
important to realize like where is that complacency because it's not i would say like there's no fine line it's like a real spectrum right as you get comfortable yeah. with 110 then maybe you're like you're comfortable at some point rewiring 110 and you're like next thing is like you're comfortable with 480 and then you're handling 480 and again you know there's a massive difference between those two voltages right if, if we're being completely honest so it's uh i think it's a very uh scary thing for me you know i've when mm -hmm. i've interviewed engineers and techs personally like that's one of my main concerns because i think trusting someone that has that fear of uh higher voltages is a lot easier than someone who's how to say it, like yeah i'm willing to like rewire this if this is live like it's perfectly fine i'm gonna go in there and get it done right like it's like let's take a step back and make sure that we're doing this yeah. yeah like let's let's make sure that we're doing this safely before we do the actual work and again as you said i think it varies from plant to plant it varies from company to company different standards uh, but there's groups who would not even touch anything unless it's completely powered down. Obviously, you can't do your checks and whatnot. But if you're doing like new installations, they would have to power off, rewire whatever, or check things and then power it back on. So it, it really differs, I think. It's really easy to say that it doesn't matter until you've actually been electrocuted. But hopefully, and hopefully you get to live past that. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, it's just so so important to not it's not it's it's real that's i think the biggest thing because yeah. that's what people that's what people are just kind of thinking it's just like they're i'm fine i'm fine i work with this stuff all the time and that's who it happens to and it happens mm -hmm. to everybody you're you're gonna touch that wrong and it i don't know it needs to be you need to keep the fear that's the yes. how do you keep the fear that's the yeah. that's the biggest question, right? And I think, you know, yeah. to your point, it's um I remember seeing this like bell curve type of a graph where, you know, at the earlier career level, you're kind of scared of the voltages. And then, as you said, you get complacent and that's where like most incident happened. And then as you see those thing, things happen to your colleagues, that's where you, like, again, the bell curve like goes down because later in your career, you're not willing to take those risks. So it, it's important to kind of, as you said, keep the fear alive, so to speak, because these are dangerous systems. Dave, what do you think, safety wise? Absolutely, I, I think that uh, that we shouldn't touch live electrical wires unless we're <laughs> locked out and tagged out. I, I think that that we have to, you know, safety has got to be the, the number one priority, and there is in the long run very little difference of spending the extra five minutes to do it right. Uh, every time compared to what will happen, you know, the one time that you have an arc flash incident and you, you know, blow a hole in your hand or uh, you wind up on a video on the internet and you are the person that is reminding everyone to, uh, to take proper precautions for arc flash. And so it's, it becomes a, it absolutely becomes a slippery slope, but you only get one chance. You, you, it only, you, yep. it only needs to go wrong once to, more than make up for all of the times that it went right and you saved a couple of minutes and you didn't lock out tag out or you didn't uh, power off everything and you're like oh it's okay you know it's only 120 and then it's only you know 208 and you're like oh it's only you know three phase 480 i do it all the time and you know it, it's only it's it's a slippery slope and i feel like we should absolutely make sure that we tell people that you should take proper safety precautions even if you don't see other people uh do it in the field and, and kind of to that point i know vlad that you had mentioned in the past uh we won't don't have to mention the, the place that you work for if you don't want but if someone were to like violate a safety pro, uh, protocol they would walk you out immediately and you'd be gone for a couple of days or something along those lines no you'd be terminated it was okay. uh you'd like be gone violating forever. those codes yeah because it's i mean it's a safety issue it's not uh obviously it's personal liability it's a liability for the mm -hmm. company you're putting others at risk as well like it's just uh not something that uh they were willing to put people through but um no yeah. it's um again like it really depends company to company i think mm -hmm. in alicia we talked about certain smaller oems do doing it a little bit differently because again maybe you don't always have personnel you don't have somebody responsible for uh hs &E, health safety and environment so there's no one really setting the tone for even nfpa trainings and unless you know that it takes that then you're not going to always 
you know, put yourself through the training. There's nobody really to to push you through that. But we had a we had a good question from uh, John Carson on uh, on YouTube. So he asked, first of all, should I use a balaclava always with 480? And he asked what to do when production pressure time schedule. So Alicia, I don't know if you know um, balaclava. Well, balaclava, it's the it's a protective like overhead piece. But I think it's uh, category number two. So I don't recall exactly if it falls under all like 480 circumstances. I think if it's properly de-energized, then it's probably category zero. Um, but anyways, I, well, I like what, I, what does the what my first question to him is, does the panel have like art flash like label on it? Mm -hmm. like, is there and because that's supposed to just tell you what you should be using now. Art flash. <laughs> and you should you should in your point. I don't remember, does it tell you all the PPE or does it tell you the category? And then I think based on the category, you, yeah. you wear certain pieces of gear. Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. Uh, and then he's also asking what to do when production pressures pressures you into the time schedule, right? And I, I guess like for me, the I think the answer is always you have to do it right. So you have to stop. But what do you see? Like, what's the average response to that? Because I don't think everybody says... No, I'm not gonna get this fixed. You know the way you wanted. We have to take the right precautions. Well, so what? What he's I think talking about is what do I? Do? He's got to turn something off, and he's got pressure to get that back on as soon as possible. And I think what he needs to do is, because uh, right now what he's doing is he's internalizing that, and so now he he feels all that pressure the entire mm -hmm. time, and that's actually like making it worse to work that way because you're just sitting there you're trying to get it done and now you have on top of that that people are you know pressuring you and they're asking you and i think at that point um you need to you know keep it locked keep it locked tagged you know whatever it is if especially if you've already got it to that place where you know they they have it off and you need to focus so you actually need to stop listening at that point um to the pressure maybe you're getting text messages or phone calls mm -hmm. and you kind of just need to go on into like silent mode and you know listen to like your favorite music and actually figure out or do the thing with everything powered off do it and you know i think over time you will find that uh people will have more faith in you because every time that you know there's, you know, there's a downtime and, and you show up and you're the one who has to do it. They'll, you know, you'll, you'll gain a reputation over time as the one who's going to like save everything. So just hold, hold on, like, and keep doing that, but keep pushing the safety aspect of it. Like, cause you, you still have to, you know, install whatever it is. And yes, you need to do it quickly, but you need to also make sure that you're safe and that, you know, nobody's going to die because that's so much yeah. worse than yeah. anything else. Like you're not willing to die for that. So unless, you know, and, and they're not either, you know, the people that are pressuring you, they're not, they're not either. They just, they need yeah. people. Everybody needs to make money. We all need to make our money. Mm -hmm. And, but we also don't need to die. And um, I think just, you know, I don't know, just, just do it, just do it. And don't, and don't worry about, and don't internalize that pressure. Don't internalize that pressure. Yeah. Absolutely. Because everybody is going to give that pressure to you and hope that it works on you. And you're the only one letting it kind of work on you. You should just, I know it's impossible to like ignore that stuff, but you have to turn, you have to turn them off and finish the job. And I think to loop this back, you know, to our earlier discussion, I think communication here is also very important, right? Like, because in, I guess what I've seen is that a lot of times people who pressure you to quote unquote cut those corners and do it faster usually just don't have the knowledge of some of these systems, right? Like these could be like production managers, supervisors who are very knowledgeable in their own domain, but they don't understand the dangers of electrical systems. And again, depending on where you work, they might not even have a safety protocol that's currently in place to maybe even put them up to speed of what it takes to actually service a panel. So 
my advice would be to actually explain to those people what it takes and how long it's going to be and whatever time you give them should be again we are considered experts in systems integration so our kind of i wouldn't say like advice but what we tell them should be uh considered right like in, in, instead of just pushing their own timelines but Ali, I want to maybe transition into talking where you are at today. So since you've done all these projects, you've done the Greenfield project, you've you've been in process, where are you at today? Can you give us a, a little story behind that and uh, <laughs> how that is going? Sure. Um, so I have been, I feel like every kind of manufacturing type of engineer, even if it was for only a year, um, and you know, I've jumped around in terms of the companies that I've worked for, and at, I'm at a point where I I love manufacturing and I um, and I love controls and I love how things work and I love building things, and um, I have stepped into uh, or I guess out of my comfort zone and into the realm of you know. Uh, company ownership. And so I started a, a LLC, a controls firm, basically. Um, and we you know we do everything that systems integrators do. And that's kind of why I was trying to define systems integration mm -hmm. was to just, you know, because everyone has their own opinion of what that is. Um, and because, and it's something that's changing anyway. So mm -hmm. it, it will never actually be definable. So I think that's a really cool aspect of it. Um, is because you can't, you know, people say we teach automation. Well, you're going to be able to do that forever because it's never going to stay the same. Um, when I think that's just really cool to uh, be working in that. But um, that is what I'm doing right now. And so I am, you know, kind of open for any kind of manufacturing projects. Um, and when I say any, I, I specifically, you know, want to target um, manufacturing processes in food and beverage or pharmaceutical where you're actually, you know, doing traditional process controls on the front end. And then downstream, you, you still need, you know, robotics and machinery for packaging. And, you know, and, and even for the entire facility, you know, I, I like supporting utilities. Um, and so there's just, you know, for me, like I, my little, I have, my company is called Process and Controls Engineering LLC, and that's way too long. So I shortened <laughs> it. So that's PCE LLC is good enough. And, um, but so PCE um, has a logo of Bliss Robotic Robot, like on the right side. And then the left side is a um, diaphragm, like a control valve. It is a control valve. Um, and to kind of symbolize like the yin and yang of the two schools of, you know, controls thought for, you know, like discrete manufacturing and motion and robotics and the, you know, process engineering, uh, PID loops and continuous, you know, continuous control or continuous automation. That's um, pretty cool. I didn't know that there was like a, process uh, industries. I like the thought behind the logo. That's pretty cool. <laughs> So I have those two together because you're usually not going to see them together. So I think that's kind of what I wanted was just to be like, hey, why are those two things like together? Um, because I want um, that's, you know, that that is me. Um, and is and your I, goal, love, I, I love guess, both of those. Is your goal to specialize maybe in a certain domain or you're looking for a wide uh, range of projects? Because I mean. You have experience anywhere from designing panels to doing like CAD drawings for that to uh, creating PNIDs to, you know, programming PLCs, HMIs, robotics. Like, is there one area that you prefer or are you looking to do kind of all of them or even, you know, just spec out equipment that third parties would program, for instance? So in terms of I have like, I guess, industries that I want to work in but what type of work I don't like I I am a true systems integrator I actually like all of that um I guess maybe my least favorite I can make list my least <laughs> favorite parts but like that's how it works like I love all of that stuff like HMI development is actually my least favorite really yeah oh, spending wonder. spending the time to do the screens is what bugs me the most and I'm like I want to give this to anybody anybody else 
Um, and I, like everything else that I consider, you know, systems integration, I, I absolutely love. But um, when it comes to, you know, what equipment I love working with, um, I really, really, really like sanitary, you know, stainless piping. Um, so that's why I really like the food and bev and pharma. And then I really mm -hmm. like, um, Well, I guess, yeah, ph pharma and food and beverage um, and any operations involving uh, creating food um, and GMP processes. That's kind of where I want to, um, I've, I've always kind of stayed there and I have a, um, like an interest in, in biochemistry. So I guess I just like, you know, the, the pharma aspect is super cool. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to do systems integration for food and beverage. If, if, that, if I can have anything that I want, that's you know, where I want to do that. But um, all industries have a lot of the same stuff. Um, you know, all that stuff behind you is in everybody's industry. So I'm open um, to integrate. I'm, I especially open to integrate things that have not been integrated before. That's really fun. Like new products. New products are new products with you know, old products are updating, you know, old, old systems to new control systems. Um, whether you're changing the vendor because you're not happy anymore, or you're just getting the, the newest thing that that awesome vendor has. Um, yeah, no, that's, so I, uh, there's, uh, I think a lot of uh, interesting projects coming up, you know, especially with manufacturing, I think somewhat coming back from, um, you know, from Asia back to the US, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities uh, going your way for sure. Dave, what do you think? What are your, your thoughts on the industry and what Alicia is no, no, looking I, to do? I, I like it. I think, I think it's exciting. So one of our first episodes, Preston was on and we were talking about Envision, which is the control systems company that he's building. And I think they were in the process of setting up their panel shop. And so we have kind of been following him along his journey. I think it'll also be interesting as we kind of follow you along your journey with PCE being I think you said you went full time two or three months ago. So very new as you as you get to go through this. So you're looking for food and bev or pharma customers in the Pacific Northwest looking for well anywhere a, anywhere. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Anyway, do you do you have any specific platforms that uh, that you like, or are you kind of willing to do and have experience with a variety? Um, so I my most of my experience is in in Rockwell, okay. um, but I. I'm starting to get into Siemens and I'm very interested in it. Um, so, so both of those. Okay. Rockwell and Siemens. I mean, that gives you like 92 and a half percent market coverage. <laughs> in North America. Yes. <laughs> in North America. Yes. Uh, I would probably give you similar uh, across Europe as well. If we include Siemens and Rockwell in That's both true. of that. So, uh, so, so you've got some, some good experience. So I think it'll be very interesting and exciting to kind of follow you along and see how you kind of m merge those historical process controls with the robots and, and everything else in between. Thank you. Absolutely. So I do, I do have one last question. Uh, Vlad, we are getting uh, close to time. Did you have any other, uh, any other questions? Any other no, go places? ahead, Dave. Okay, perfect. So uh, actually before uh, I asked the last question, we actually had a really good conversation with IT versus OT on LinkedIn. So thank you for, for Brandon and Skylar and Carlos and Frank uh, for, for having that. We, we just, uh, one of those we were unable to uh, to get back talking about. I don't who, think it got uh, settled. I don't think it got settled. But. No. Well, I I think I think it got settled with sometimes the OT guys just put secret PCs and that's why they don't let the IT guys. But like I think we agree patches and, and updates are good and sometimes we just need secret PCs that no one knows about. And if you're listening on the podcast, I'm doing like those air quotes like with both sets of hands. So <laughs> secret PC is on the OT side is I think what we uh, what we settled with, which I've is tried to hide it. We can't hide it. We can't I mean, you it. have oh, to, how, like, I mean, I've been in so many environments <laughs> where- Vlad for the secret PCs. Oh my God. I mean, you so, okay. So I'll give a quick story, right? So I'll give a quick story. There's a lot of facilities right now mm -hmm. who are virtualizing virtualizing your development software, right? So if you want to open Studio 5000, you get this like HP notebook 
you go on the server and then you can connect obviously to any PLC that has been networked at that facility. But the reality is that there's still a lot of like really old PLCs to which you need to connect over like an RS-232 or like 485 cable. And so it's impossible to connect from that server to that PLC. And for some reason, mm -hmm. I guess it's very, I had these conversations again with like IT management, like we have PLCs here that are 30 years old that are not networked to the software that you've put. And then, you know, they restrict that same laptop from you to be able to install any <laughs> software. So even if you have the software, you can't install it on their machine. And so there's always this dilemma where like you have to get an eBay computer to bring to your facility. A secret computer. <laughs> I mean, secret computer. Like, it's just, you know, again, I, I've tried to like explain it to them. And, you know, Don't we tell. have this, like, I have the conversation and it just like, I don't know. I, I couldn't get through to them, but anyways, Vlad's that's just my some story. some PTSD flashbacks right here. Like, Absolutely. We, we, secret Absolutely. PCs are a very touchy topic for Vlad. Um, but, but no, it's, I, I've seen, most PLC5s I've seen are, are generally not networked because the, the cards to network them in. Uh, at, at that point, it's almost cost effective just to look at uh, PLC upgrades that you know you're going to have to do in a few years anyway. Right. And they're unwilling to invest in those upgrades, right? So it's like, <laughs> we can't network it, but then we can't have the PC to support it. And again, your manufacturing folks or the operations folks pressure you to keep the line running. So you just, you have no other option, really. I mean, I, I think you kind of laid Windows it out 98. perfectly. Yeah. Look, like, we're not upgrading. We're not adding anything else. Keep the line running. I mean, you, you just described systems integration and anyone that lives on the <laughs> job perfectly Vlad uh no 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 but, but so, so that that was a great conversation and I feel like it is the first of many IT OT conversations um that uh that we've uh th that we will continue to have box. Have, yes and and especially as we watch uh Ellie says your career progresses and PCE continues to have more and more opportunities it will be interesting to hear some more of these firsthand conversations that you have and maybe we can have a tally somewhere of the secret pcs that she installed in places. <laughs> no but but perfect so uh one last question for you a similar question that we ask everyone um everyone wants to know where, where you like to learn stuff where you like to consume content uh and i know you said you were, you enjoy watching youtube so other than solus plc um, which is where this is hosted and where Vlad, Vlad puts great tutorials. Do you have a couple of recommendations of a place of, of channels to check out? Um, I really like Tim Wilborn. Tim? Ch Tim yeah. at least was in the chat earlier. I don't know if he's <laughs> still in the chat. He, he has a great, uh, he has a great, I, I love, I, I listened to, he had a uh, UL 508 certification uh, podcast and video that he put out. Um, early in the uh, the spring that that was a very good video i learned so much about it uh th that certification process that i had never known before he uh, he does have a great channel but otherwise i would say me follow me <laughs> okay right. absolutely um I, I feel like we have missed and i, I don't have the uh, the youtube channel to uh, to drop in the chat so chat please forgive us as, as vlad is frantically typing to uh to try to tra drop the uh, the appropriate links in there and then for everyone that isn't uh, isn't familiar with your channel, uh, what type of what type of videos do you put out? Alicia, do you still hear us? What type of uh, yes. videos do you have on your channel? Oh, oh, I put no. See, I don't have a, a YouTube channel, but I I meant put like watch me on LinkedIn. Oh, and yes. I have, I have Absolutely. everybody's YouTube stuff, everybody's YouTube I, stuff all the time. Do. I was going to say, I think directly like vendors six, even too. I, I think so I've I like seen like six people's... YouTube videos go up on your LinkedIn so far today. Oh yeah. So even in one day, I'll just watch like massive amounts of YouTube videos um, because there's, I feel like I wish back when I was in college, all of these YouTube videos were around. Yep. Because I would have would have understood so much better all of these things that now I know, you know, are important. Um, I don't know. There's just a lot of really, really good material on YouTube. And you really can learn anything in the world yep. on Absolutely. YouTube, yep. um, including systems integration. Um, and there's lots of really good content. So, um, yeah. No, Follow absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. I, I appreciate it. I, I think that this is fantastic. Vlad, do you have any other thoughts 
Uh, Vlad, I guess, Vlad or Ellie, should you do either of you have any other thoughts before we wrap up and thank everyone for their time? Uh, no, I mean, I think we can dive into some more integration topics, <laughs> but no, really appreciate it. Really appreciate your thoughts. Like I said, I think it would be really cool to recheck in with you at some point in time, you know, see mm-hmm. what kind of projects you're working on. And obviously there's going to be other stories which may or may not be proprietary to those projects. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll touch base for sure, but really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yes, I'll thank be back. You. Th- thank, uh, thank you, everyone. This has been episode 27 of the Manufacturing Hub podcast. And as we learn from everyone else, this is where we ask you to like and subscribe and rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts because it apparently uh, means something. And tell us what your favorite component is uh, in Vlad be, uh, behind his head. Uh, and yeah, um, we will see BFDs. everyone. You BFDs. We'll see everyone uh, next week on Wednesday, same time, same place. Talk to everyone. Thank you, soon. everyone.